Well, the campaigns are in full swing. Uh, it is a, a media frenzy. You can't turn on the television and watch a game in peace because of all the advertisements. Facebook, which is normally a living scrapbook, is now mostly political diatribe and no fun to look at. The phone rings every night. I don't know about at your house, but it rings every night. At my house, somebody wants to either influence my vote or know how I already voted. Lots of speeches and commentators and pundits. A lot of words, 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 lots of words. It reminded me of a Frank and Ernest cartoon. I don't know if you like Frank and Ernest, but a day doesn't go by that I don't read Frank and Ernest. And uh, a couple of elections ago, maybe three or four presidential elections ago, there was a Frank and Ernest cartoon that has Frank sitting on the airplane very, looking very distraught. And he asked the stewardess, are there any air airbags on this airplane? To which she replies, yes, there are several congressmen in first class. <laughs> I don't know about you, but I am ready for a break, a rest from the airbags. This election cycle has done nothing to improve the reputation of politics uh, in America. I, I heard somebody, I was out in the town eating in a restaurant, and I heard somebody going on about how disgusted they were, and they wanted no part of politics ever again. And you, you may agree, but the reality is there's no part of life that is not concerned with politics. Now, I'm not talking about the mudslinging innuendo and accusations of our presidential election. And I'm not really talking about that part of public life that has to do with government. That's politics in a very narrow sense. I'm, I'm talking about something really much more basic. Politics is about people and the relationships with other people, with the relationships between groups of people. The word, it, it comes from the Greek word for polis, which we know is city or even community. Politics has to do with the way we live together in community. It has to do with the way we order our lives. Life is political. Every decision we make, everything we say, every action we take has political consequences because we don't live in isolation. We we are connected. As someone once said, when I sneeze, my neighbor catches cold. So the question is not, will I be political? The question is, what kind of politics will I practice? How will my words, my actions, my decisions affect the people around me? All, All Saints Day, I think, is a it's a good day to think about politics in this broader sense of the world. The word today we remember not isolated individuals who lived in a world alone and passed through it without affecting anyone or being affected by anyone. We remember those who have touched us, those who are part of our community, those who traveled with our polis for a time. And we remember that we're connected. And how we impacted each other and how we impacted the world. They impacted the world around us. On All Saints Sunday, we pause to remember our fellow citizens from this place that are part of the household of God who are no longer present with us in body, but whose memory we cherish, we hold dear. We, we remember those who, who have now joined that larger city that larger community towards which we are all moving and which we already have a citizenship, the kingdom of God, the new Jerusalem, we remember those who have died in the last year and we call to mind their impact on us and our relationships with them. In other words, we call to mind our politics and so with that in mind, I invite, for you, invite you to hear the lesson for today from the Gospel of Luke, the sixth chapter, beginning in verse 20. Then he, Jesus, looked up at his disciples and said, Blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. 
Blessed are you who are hungry now, for you will be filled. Blessed are you who weep now, for you will laugh. Blessed are you when people hate you and when they exclude you, revile you, and defame you on account of the Son of Man. Rejoice in that day and leap for joy, for surely your reward is great in heaven, for what, that is what their ancestors did to the prophets. But woe to you who are rich, for you have received your consolation. Woe to you who are full now, for you will be hungry. Woe to you who are laughing now, for you will mourn and weep. Woe to you when all speak well of you, for that is what their ancestors did to the false prophets. But I say to you that listen, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you, bless those who curse you, pray for those who abuse you. If anyone strikes you on the cheek, offer the other also. And from anyone who takes away your coat, do not withhold even your shirt. Give to everyone who begs from you. And if anyone takes away your goods, do not ask for them again. Do to others as you would have them do to you. The word of God for the people of God today. Thanks be to God. If we listen to those words, if we can hear the teachings of Jesus uh, in, in, in the Sermon on the Mount, it is impossible to realize their political impact. It's hard to hear those words, though. It's hard to hear them because we've heard them so often and, and because we've, we've sort of spiritualized them. We, uh, right after the Lord's Prayer and the Ten Commandments, the Beatitudes are the third most religious made art into plaques and wall hangings and cross stitch. And, and, and if you've made it into a plaque, I'm not sure you can really hear it the same way. It's important, I think, to begin with the observation that Jesus addresses the Beatitudes not to the crowd, but to the disciples. This is a word for Jesus' followers you may have noticed in verse 20, it said, Jesus looked up at his disciples and said, this is a word aimed at believers, at the followers of Jesus. He says to them, blessed are you who are poor. Often we remember it as blessed are the poor, but in this Luke says, he says, blessed are you who are poor. He is addressing the disciples who have just given up their livelihood and their families to follow him. They have become poor to pursue following Jesus. The Beatitudes are really a commendation for the disciples and the way they are living into what it means to be disciples. He, he says to them, blessed are you, essentially, blessed are you 12 for the things you are doing, have done as you have served with me. The Sermon on the Mount, some have called an ordination service for the disciples. It is an endorsement of their behavior. So why would it be important to know that he looks up at the disciples and says, blessed are you? I think this is why, because I think unless we have a relationship with Jesus, unless we have recognized who Jesus is, unless we have a trust relationship with God, we will think that the teachings of the Beatitudes are ridiculous and they're not possible to follow. It is only if we have recognized that Jesus is the Messiah of God, that he is the Son of God and shows the way and the truth, it is only from that posture of surrender that we have a relationship of enough trust that we can step out. You see, sometimes I think we get the cart before the horse and we say, oh, well, I'll take a little bit of Jesus' teaching and they will change me. And to really become a full-fledged follower, I think we have to surrender to the Holy Spirit that the Holy Spirit changes us and redeems us and begins that process of sanctification which gives us the confidence and the trust to live differently. This is a word for those who would claim to be followers of Jesus. Maybe we could hear it if it was phrased a little differently than, than we normally hear it. Blessed are the poor, or blessed who are you or who are poor, sounds kind of dignified and, and somehow pious, and I think we lose the ironic force of it. What if we said, 
congratulations, you that have nothing, for yours is the domain of God. That might get a little closer to the Spirit. Or congratulations, you who are hungry now, for your turn is coming to be full. Or good for you who are crying today, for your time of laughter is on the way. Or the woes, rather than woe, we don't use that word too often. What if Jesus had said, I feel sorry for those of you who are rich because you've gotten all you're ever going to get. I feel sorry for you who are full because the day is coming when you will go without. Too bad that you laugh today because pain and sorrow are just around the corner. Imagine if you were in that audience and you overheard those words. Jesus is talking to his disciples, to his followers, and you're over here. If I overheard those words and if I'm poor, I might think, great, another politician and preacher telling me how great it is to be poor. You know, there might have been a level of cynicism that said, I don't feel too great to me. Or maybe, maybe we might be moved with revolutionary zeal and we might say, right on, bring on the revolution, let's take over. That might be the way we hear it. But what if I'm comfortable? What if I'm well fed? What if I've got a good job and a, and a house with a mortgage that has seven or eight years left till it's paid off? And how would those words hit me then? They might be unsettling. They might plant a seed of doubt in my mind that, that this comfortable life is a house of cards that could come tumbling down. They might be offensive. I might think, why doesn't somebody shut this guy up? Which, of course, is what they did to Jesus. It's what they did. They crucified him. You don't crucify somebody because he feeds people. You don't crucify somebody because he's a faith healer. He makes people well. You don't crucify somebody because they make fun of the religious leaders of the day. I mean, you don't crucify stand-up comics and, and, and do-gooders. You crucify people who are subversive. You crucify people who, who, who are trying to turn the world upside down. The Romans crucified Jesus because they recognized that the politics of his words and his deeds had the potential to turn their world upside down. I mean, think about it. What would happen? What would happen if a large number of people suddenly began to believe that, that we should really love our enemies? That we should pray for them? That we should do good for them? What if a large number believed it and actually did it? Well, we think right off, well, it sounds good, but... I guess that depends on where you sit, doesn't it? If you are the CEO of a defense contractor, loving your enemy might not sound so good all of a sudden. What about our banking industry or stock market? If there was a significant group of people who, who believed and practiced lending without interest, forgiving debts, what would that do to our world? You see... Those who are called, those of us who call ourselves followers of Jesus, we can't escape that following Jesus means practicing a particular kind of politics. The politics of love, the politics of nonviolence, of generosity, of mercy, and that brand of politics sets us squarely against the grain of the world. The world says the strong survive and the weak perish. It's the law of nature, the survival of the fittest. But, but the politics of Jesus says that the strong must protect the weak until they can become strong. The world's politics says grab all you can. But the politics of the saints says from everyone who wishes to take your coat, give also your shirt. The politics of the world says an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. But, but the politics of the saints says if someone strikes you on one cheek, offer them also the other. The world says you, you got to look out for number one. But Jesus says be merciful even as your Father in heaven is merciful. The politics of Jesus are hard. They're hard to hear. 
They're even harder to think about living by. For most of us ordinary people who are trying to provide for our families and educate our kids and live a decent life and do the good that we want to do, we try, but we think to ourselves, we're not heroes. We're not Mother Teresa or St. Francis or Joan of Arc. We're, we're not saints. But then there's the rub, isn't it? Because we are. It's exactly what Paul and the other writers of the New Testament called the Christian community, the Christian polis. The Christian community was the saints. The word means holy one. It doesn't mean holy in the sense of particularly pious. It means holy in terms of set apart, called out, distinctive We are God's distinctive people, God's called out ones. Or if you have an old Bible, uh, old English translation is God's peculiar people. Now, some of us fit that definition more than others. But God's peculiar people, I think that says it. It's pretty peculiar to practice the politics of Jesus, the politics of the saints, If we return good for evil, blessing for curse, generosity for selfishness, mercy for ruthlessness, we will be distinctive. And like the song says, they'll know we are Christians by our love. That's who we are called out to be. Peculiar people, set apart, distinctive because of the way we relate with each other and the world. Today is All Saints Sunday, and we remember our ordinary Christians who've been a part of this community that have traveled with us in time. We remember how they struggled to faithfully live into the teachings of Jesus. We we hold in our hearts those who've shown us the way of love and, and the way of generous living. We remember parents and grandparents and the witness and the way that they shaped us. With thanksgiving, we remember those who brought us to church and to the baptismal font and who first taught us about Jesus. We remember Sunday school teachers, youth workers, and how they their faith. They shared their faith with us through their lessons and sometimes in spite of their lessons. We remember those from this family that have traveled together, those people who pointed us towards God, those people who made it easier to believe in God. We remember and give thanks because it's never easy. It's never easy to stand out You may remember in the closing of George Bernard Shaw's play about St. Joan, Joan of Arc, the saint has just discovered that the church has made her a saint. It's the same church that 400 years before burned her at the stake as a heretic. And she says in in Shaw's writing, O God who madest the earth, when will it be ready for thy saints? You know, if you try to live by the politics of Jesus, the politics of the saints, that will be your sentiment because you will stand out. You will be distinctive. You will wonder when will the world be ready? It's always swimming against the current and that's hard. We don't like to be distinctive in that way. They did an experiment at a university They gathered a group of people, they put them in a jury box, you know, 12 of them in a row, and and they put headphones on them, and their assignment was to listen for for noises and to count them, and then a buzzer would sound, and they would report how many noises, they, how many sounds they had heard. And this, there were, you know, faculty, administration, students, all of these people in this, in this experiment. They were all sitting there, and they had their headphones on, and, and the guy sitting in seat number 12 was a professor who, who thought a lot of himself, and he thought, oh, this is such a juvenile experiment, but, but I'll go along. And so he was sitting there, and, and, and so they played the sounds, and he counted them. There were 18 sounds. It was an easy assignment. They called on the person in chair number one, and she said 16, and he kind of smiled. She, she can't even do this. But then number two said 16, and number three said 16, and number four, all the way up to number 11. So when they got to number 12, guess what Professor Know-It-All said? 16. 
He said, I, I must have counted wrong. So they did another round, and, and there were clearly nine sounds, but every one of the 11 before him said, 11. And so when it was his turn, he thought, well, maybe I got it wrong again. I was upset by the first one. He said 11. They went round after round. But what he didn't know was that there weren't 12 subjects in this experiment. There was one. And the good professor was it. And the idea was, is how ridiculous do you have to get before you stand up and say, no, it was this number. But time after time, he resigned himself to go along with the 11. It's hard to stand out. It's hard to be different. It happens every day when we give in to the politics and the ways of the world and we lose our distinctiveness. Jesus praised the disciples that day for their faithfulness. He promised, uh, he praised them for what they were doing. And I don't think that was pie in the sky. I think it was praise for their obedience and their action to live right now in light of the truth we know about eternity. To live the politics of the kingdom of God during the political world of this realm. Today, we, we remember and celebrate those among us who didn't just go along We celebrate and remember our local saints, those who stood out to us in special ways. And I hope and believe that in remembering them, we find courage and faith and and we'll try, however difficult it may be, to be faithful ourselves in, in practicing the politics of heaven in the midst of this world. We gather this morning to eat and to drink the bread and the wine of heaven to gain strength for the rigors that are lay ahead because it will be hard. The journey is not easy. We remember today these faithful ones who've gone ahead to the realm of God, those for whom faith has been swallowed up in sight. The things that we only see in visions and dreams and hopes, they see face to face. And so we gather to remember, to remember them, to remember their witness, and to remember who we are. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Your order for Holy Communion can be found on the insert uh, that is in your bulletin. I remind you that you do not have to be a member of this church or a member of any church for that matter, but, but to know that you are welcome at this table that our table is open to all who would come, for indeed it is not our table, but it is Christ's own table. Hear these words of invitation. Christ our Lord invites to his table all who love him, who earnestly repent of their sin and seek to live in peace with one another. Therefore, let us confess our sin before God and one another. Merciful God, we confess that we have not loved you with our whole heart, We have failed to be an obedient church. We have not done your will. We have broken your law. We have rebelled against your love. We have not loved our neighbors, and we have not heard the cry of the needy. Forgive us, we pray. Free us for joyful obedience. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Hear the good news. Christ died for us while we were yet sinners. That proves God's love towards us. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. You You are forgiven. forgiven. Glory to God. Amen. I invite you to stand and greet those around you this morning and exchange signs of peace.
be seated. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Almighty God, Creator of heaven and earth, God of Abraham and Sarah, God of Miriam and Moses, God of Joshua and Deborah, God of Ruth and David, God of the priests and prophets, God of Mary and Joseph, God of the apostles and the martyrs, God of our mothers and our fathers, God of our children to all generations. With so with you and our on people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you and blessed is your son Jesus Christ. By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. On the night in which he gave himself up for us, he took bread, gave thanks to you, broke the bread, gave it to his disciples, and said, Take, eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. When the supper was over, he took the cup, gave thanks to you, gave it to his disciples and said, drink from this all of you. For this is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sin. Do this as oft as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of these your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Renew our communion with all your saints, especially those whom we name before you. Margaret King Edenfield. Murray Ashley Nixon. Virginia Price Grant Thigpen. Guy Moxley Hayes Jr. Mary Hooper Ketchy. Jean McDaniel Gillen. Betty Don Shelby. Oscar Smith Spivey. Gay Piper Gwinner. Corinne Barrett Williams. Miller Gordon Edwards III. Howard J. Williams, Jr. Robin Hamilton Floyd. Mary Ann Irby. Suzanne N. Whitaker. May Fluellen McMillan. And there are others who have been saints to us who have died this year 
that while they might not be members of the church, we remember them and we name them, and I invite you to name them out loud as we light our 17th candle. 